Yeah, I would uh, like to apologize in advance that my talk is not going to be very entertaining. <laughs> Rather, it would be sort of depressing and uh, disturbing. It could be, at least part of it. Sorry about it, but that's how it's going to be. Challenging convention is not to pursue conventional challenges. Being born in a middle class family in India, I was given to understand by society and family that the primary challenges, goals, or objectives in life were to get educated, to find a secure job, to join the rat race to go up the corporate ladder, earn a lot of money, pay taxes, save as much as possible for old age, and then die. <laughs> I was following this rule book of society for the best part of my life. And at one point of time, I found that I was feeling like a horse, not a donkey, a horse. <laughs> yeah, I was feeling like a horse with blinkers on and societal pressure on my back, nudging me and kicking me to follow through the maze of life from birth till death. I couldn't bear it long. At the age of 45, I shook off that societal pressure from my back. I took off my blinkers and looked around. It was a totally different world from the corporate world where I was coming from. I saw a lot of good things. I saw a lot of bad things, sad things. And that changed my world. Half of India's population lived below the poverty line. And one third of the world's poor are from India. I started visiting slums and villages to see how life was for the poor. And I found that starting from education, health, sanitation, hygiene, drinking water, electricity, everything was in shambles. Nothing wo really worked. And of all these challenges that these people had to face every day, I found that the most pressing one was that of availability of safe drinking water. 780 million people in this world do not have access to safe drinking water. And unlike most of us, these people have a very limited choice of drinks. These and a few similar to these. And since these people are ingesting these deadly pathogens with every drop of water that they drink, 4,000 children die every day, out of which 1,600 are in India every day. I know these numbers and statistics, statistics does not really have much of an impact on most of us. We've heard them over and over again. Instead, if I had said that there had been a fire in the children's hospital last night and four children were burned to death, that news would have been very, very disturbing. Now, why is it that the news of four children dying in an accident in a particular day is so very disturbing to us, whereas the death of 4,000 children dying every day for a, for a reason, for a cause which is primarily preventable, does not really bother us. News that repeats every day becomes a statistics. And once it becomes a statistics, the individuals lose their identity. They, they do not have a name or a face. It is not Ram or Rahim, Elizabeth or Aisha. They are just numbers. Death number one, death number two, death number three, four, five, ten, hundred, thousand, two thousand, three thousand, four thousand dead children all mostly below the age of five, form the day statistics and goes into the record books. Can nothing be done about it? Do we keep our blinkers on and pretend that the problem doesn't, does not exist? I thought there were options. Chlorine added in the right proportion to the water that these people consume can get rid of most of the deadly pathogens. The question remains, how do we add this blessed chlorine into the water that these people consume? For most developing countries, the infrastructure required to supply piped safe water to each and every family is prohibitively expensive. Like we also have our own, like people in this room would have 
in their individual families some water purification system to take care of their drinking water needs. But what do these people do, the other 50%? Uh, other because they would be going to a common water point in the community where maybe 100 or 200 families would come to share their drinking water. So I thought of coming up with a design that would cater to their demands, to their needs. Untreated water goes in from the top of the device and the treated water comes out from below. Chlorine in the right proportion gets mixed inside and the water that comes out is chlorinated by default. Uh, before, rather than going into the technical details of what goes on inside, I would rather go into the different aspects of design that I had considered while thinking of this. Since it was dealing with drinking water, the dosing had to be very, very precise every time without fail. And I also thought it should be automatic so that no human intervention or human judgment was required as to how much chlorine to go into how much water so that it, it should be automatic. It had to be in line so that the chlorination, the disinfection is done. Uh, it is by default. That is, if one is feeling uh, lazy or if it is raining or uh, whether is somebody is in a hurry, they do not have to, I mean, there's no option of forgetting to chlorinate their own water. What, whatever water they get at the community water point is always, always chlorinated. Third was it had to be community scaled since it was to be dealing with a few hundred families at a time at a single water point. So it had to deal with thousands of liters of water every day. And of course, it had to be affordable, robust, and reliable. Also, had to be easy to install and it had to work without electricity since it would be installed in places where electricity would most possibly be unreliable. It should have no moving parts to fail, like levers to get jammed or some valve to leak. And a very important factor, it should require minimum behavior change so that people can come and collect their water in the same way that they have been used to. Now, I was trying to chlorinate flowing water. Dosing means adding a tiny amount of the disinfectant into a volume of untreated water. So how do I do it with a flowing water where the flow rate is inconsistent? It is random. It is intermittent. And if I were to add chlorine to the containers that these people are collecting their water in, they are collecting water in uh, containers starting from 2 liters to 20 liters. So fixed dosing was out of the question. So it had to be inside, going on inside the machine that is to be developed. And uh, that is how it was finally designed. So here are a few snapshots of where it has been running. It has been running in Sundarbans. There are two installations in Sundarbans. Spring Health in Orissa is using one of them. It's a for-profit organization that sells chlorinated water to the villages, safe water. And this particular device at Spring Health is serving more than 200 families. Uh, for, I was fortunate that Stanford University and D-Lab at MIT, both of them had taken interest in this device. D-Lab had provided me a lot of uh, support. And Stanford University researchers, along with International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research uh, Center at Bangladesh, they jointly conducted a study of this device in the slums of Dhaka. Two of these devices enjoyed their first birthday this month. And between the two of them, it has literally cleaned up 2 million liters of water for the slum dwellers during the past one year. <laughs> Goal India is also trying it out in West Bengal. And I know there are a lot of business professionals over here who would like to see this. So it is affordable. The device also is affordable, although it's still in a prototype stage, which I propose to take it into a product stage and disseminate it. And I think the depressing statistics that I was talking about earlier, I mean, together with 
the Zimbachlorine doser and the appropriate business model, we can save lives. Thank you. Just a minute. Please don't clap for me, because I'm not doing anything in this. It's gravity doing the work, not me. 